Around the world, attacks on children continue unabated as warring parties flout one of the most basic rules of law, or rather war, the protection of children. The protracted nature of these conflicts today is affecting the futures of the entire generation of children. In Nigeria, a special report shows that Kanu, Akwaibum, eight other states have housed most of the out-of-school children in Nigeria. Well, the big question is, how safe are these children if they go into classrooms? Well, joining us to discuss this is educationist and co-founder of Trustee Education Reform Innovation Team, Bolaji Osime, and educational consultant, Ikechi Wogu. Thank you very much, gentlemen and lady, for joining us. Thank you. Great. Absolutely. Interesting. Um, I'm going to start with you, Bolaji. Uh, I remember that we, were, we had a conversation about out-of-school children in 2019, vividly I remember. We were in this studio, um, it was the eve of elections, or if I'm not mistaken, election day in 2019, and we were still talking about the same thing. Fast forward to 2021, we're still talking about the same thing. And this time, not just about getting kids into classrooms, we're talking about how safe these classrooms can be from destruction, especially uh, at a time where Nigeria is facing its toughest experience with insecurity. So my first big question is, how did we even get here? Because now you're advocating on two fronts. In terms of um, getting here, you know, sometimes I wonder, because this is a... Um, as far as I'm concerned, education is a fundamental human right and is enshrined in the Constitution that every child in Nigeria must have education, it must be free, and it must be compulsory. So the question is, how did we get here in the first place? Because this is something enshrined in our Constitution. This is something that is the law by the 2003 um, Child's Act to protect children that every child must have basic education. So the question is, why is this not being enforced? Why would we have children uh, of about 10 million out of school? How are we having the challenges we're having in the first place? Because if we understand how important education is in this country, and the fact that we must build our human capital in order to be able to empower and to ensure we harness our resources, then we'll not take this lightly. So that's the big dollar, million dollar question. How did we get here and what are we going to do about it? Because I think we're just talking about it, we're talking about it, we've been talking about it forever. Is it that 10 million, is 30 million? What are we going to do about it? We need to crack this terrible malaise that is uh, plaguing this nation of the fact that our children are out of school, our children are being kidnapped, our children are not, they're the most important, um, they're, they're the most important to us. That's the future of Nigeria. So as far as we're concerned, something has to happen and it has to happen fast. EKG, just picking up from where she, she just dropped it, um, this is the future of this country. And if we have millions of them out of school, we're still having to deal with the fact that we haven't even scratched the surface of our uh, MDG uh, goals um, you know, for the United Nations in terms of education. We're still having to grapple with that. Now, how do you even convince a parent to let their child go to school when it's literally not even safe to be in one? The, the bigger challenge to me is our lack of intentionality in almost anything that we do as a nation. So um, Nigeria seems to be a nation that is driven very critically by happenstance. And that's where the bigger challenge is for me, because it's like insecurity just happens. It's like out of school, the out of school um, concern just happens. So a lot of parents give birth to children without a plan without a future, and it has become um, kind of like our thing in Nigeria. So we're breeding a nation of uh, children who are out of school, not because they ought to be out of school, but because um, the parents don't even plan for them. So you have some state governments um, in the list that have come up with free education. Um, but even where education is free, how well enforced is it that children within the school age um, um, uh, 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 lifestyle seasons will need to go to school. It's not really important. So even where um, some states, I know back in the day, like in River State, they made it compulsory, and there were law enforcement agents going about trying to insist 
that children should be sent to school. But some of these children were no longer living with their parents. They were living with nannies, they were living with, um, with, um, with uncles, with aunties, and these ones would subject them to child labor. So the bigger challenge to me is that um, some of the parents have not even embraced the need for, for schooling for these school age children because they really don't see the, the case for education. So before you even talk about insecurity, before you talk about other concerns, they feel these children should come help them out in the farms. They feel these children should help them sell, sell goods and wares on the streets. These children should, should engage in another kind of schooling, like in the East. Okay, they, they have a, a different kind of schooling arrangement where some school age children are required to go help some uncle in his shops, in electronic shops, in his bookstore and all that. It's another kind of empowerment, but it's not the formal kind of education that we're looking at. So when from the family front, education is not embraced as the real deal. And then government seems to be um, a little casual about their dealings, not just on education, but in every other area. Then it becomes a big challenge to say, um, I as a parent must get my child to school. So it becomes like, okay, I am serious. I am intentional about getting my children to school. But what about you? What about the other man out there? It's not something we are doing um, as a national concern. We're not even calculating the, the, the impact of all of this in the next couple of years. So mm. let's look at the future where these children should be the leaders of Nigeria. And then they are now mostly illiterate or in some cases dropouts from school. Um, then you ask the question, which way Nigeria? It becomes really scary for our future. Mm. Mm. Um, Mr. Sime, interesting point that um, Ikechi has made. Every single month, our governments are budgeting, and I'm not. Let's not just talk about the federal government. States are involved. For example, I'm going to talk about River State. So, a governor Wike is building, building um, flyovers, building street. I mean, he's called Mr. Projects for a reason. But how many schools, how many classroom projects has he had in the space of how many years that he's been governor? He, this is his second tenure. How many schools has he renovated? How many classrooms has he built? No, we haven't seen that. It's not replicated in the education sector, but we see more roads and, you know, all of those flyovers in River State. And this is not an attack on the governor, but this is ditto for every other governor who seems to be commissioning these white elephant projects. But then the most important thing, which they all benefited from, by the way, is being um, somewhat set aside or tossed aside. So how do educationists like you and Ikechi push for these um, meager portions of for education budgeting uh, to be increased because whether we like it or not it might not necessarily look nice for them in their blueprint or when they're doing like a scorecard for themselves but how can we push for this to become a big priority for all our politicians because whether we like it or not there is some politics to it absolutely i mean i you know i just read that um the education budget, the federal one, was about just about uh, 6.3, you know, and it's about 742 billion out of about, say, 11 trillion or so was earmarked to education this year. That is extremely low. So it just tells you that the government is not paying attention to education at all. This is a time when we're saying that we have a lot of out of school. This is a time when we have insurgency issues. This is a time when COVID has caused a lot of loss of learning. I mean, if you see the kind of money that is being put towards COVID in every other country, a lot of schools have been shut down for the greater part of last year. A lot of public schools are still doing staggered lessons. So you just wonder um, what our government is looking at. And like Nkechi said, if they understand the importance of the human capital, the importance of the young people they are bringing up, they're going to actually build the economy. Because you have all these um, resources in Nigeria. Nigeria is one of the most resourced nations in the world, but the human capital is the most important. In countries like um, Singapore, that they don't have oil and, oil and they have, don't have natural resources, they invest so much in the human capital. And that's what we should do. Nigeria, God has blessed us in this country, not only with human resources, but with natural resources. So what happens is you just wonder why state government, in Lagos State though, Lagos State is building, despite the fact that Lagos State is not a big, you know, we don't have land in Lagos State, but the governor is actually building infrastructure and improving 
the um, state of um, schools. He's focusing because Lagos State is cosmopolitan. This is a state that needs very cerebral human capital. We need people who know what they're doing. So he understands that his economy is built on the human capital and the way he educates his young people. And he's focusing on that. And I do believe that some other states are doing that as well. In fact, there has been evidence that has shown that although the Northwest has about, um, I think it has about 5.2 million out of school, but certain states have put a lot of money in education, I think like Shokoto during Governor Tambu, well, at that time, and the insurgency went down. You know, when you don't put money in education, you'll find that crime rate is going to go up because the young people are going to, they don't have jobs, they don't have skills, they don't have a vocation. And so what are they going to do? So they're ripe for ripping by uh, Boko Haram and all the insurgencies because mm. they, they don't have anything. Mm. So we must connect the, the dots in Nigeria. If we don't <laughs> educate our children, then we are opening them up to be recruited for different types of crime, see what kidnapping is doing. If we educate them, they will have a vocation, they will have a job, and they won't get involved. So it doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take anything so smart on to figure that out. Mm. So that's why we always wonder, why do we have, why are we not doing this? China has a massive human capital. Every other country is going to China to set up their manufacturing units, and they're using the human capital, and they're paying dollars. And Nigeria is massive. We're 200 million now by... 250, we're going to be 400 million. Third mm. largest country in the world. Mm. In the world. What are we going to do then? I wonder. If we don't stop it out now, what are we going to do? It's only 10 million out of school. Guess that's, what? That, that's, that's the billion dollar question. Uh, but EKG, in closing, um, just, uh, just as she said, and I'm going to ask you now again, um, politics is the order of the day as we speak right now. Their campaigns. The president was in the emo state um, he's going there because, of course, um, um, he went to inspect a project and commission it. Uh, and it's all political. Politics is the order of the day. 2023 is in view. And all the movements we're seeing in the different political parties is, of course, targeted as to, at 2023. While these politicians are moving, what are your people, people like you, doing to plug in and so that our children can benefit from it? I'll tell you what quickly. Um, one of the things that was said or pointed to as a result of or what has led to the banditry, these young men who are in, I had a, a conversation with Sheikh Gumi, and he said that these people have not had access to education, they do not have jobs, an idle mind, of course, is the devil's workshop, and therefore we're having a multiplication of these bandits every single day. If we do plug into education and give at least a certain amount or chunk of our budget to it, um, can we say that maybe our children will now be safer in schools because these bandits would have depleted in their numbers because we, they have something to do? Yeah, obviously, um, um, I, I don't even like the open-ended statement that more uh, increased budget is allotted to education. I think it should be specific. Budget for infrastructure or budget for, for, for facilities or budget for textbooks or budget for security. You see, education is broad-based. But, you know, how attractive have we made education become? You need to cover that with politics, with growing interest in politics. We seem to downplay the need for education. I mean, we talk about ASU strikes and all that. So it seems like those who, who have invested their lives in the details, the required details for learning and schooling, are not high up there. The best um, an educationist can become in Nigeria is probably uh, a minister or a commissioner. So he's not given that place. How rich are the teachers? How rich are the professors? Okay, so their salaries are not even promptly paid. They are not given money for research. What is the budget for research like? And all of that. So these are many questions begging for answers. And then, at the other end, you want to make the young child who's not even primarily interested in education to go to school. He has seen the neighbor out there next door who's not doing very well simply because he's, he's, he's educated. He's a professor versus the politician who's riding all the big cars and all that. So you, you, you realize that in Nigeria, to start with, um, by the kind of politics that we play, education is grossly downplayed 
upon. Education is trampled underfoot. Education is not what uh, the nominal child should aspire towards. If you're looking at money, if you're looking at living a very large lifestyle, so you realize that a lot of a lot of children who even dropped out of the university are probably doing well in, in entertainment. Mm. They are doing well in comedy. They are doing well in in other things. Mm. Here we have entertainers who even have their doctorate now. Okay, I could call names of those who have gone on to get their doctorate. But in, in politics, in politics, you realize that. Um, you would see a professor who seems like an errand boy to a politician who's not even properly schooled. So what is the incentive for learning? Why should I go to school? Why should I advance my educational course if education needs that push in my life? Okay, mm. so uh, politics, we should be careful so as not to kill education and okay. the interest for education using politics. Because okay. it's, it's becoming a big bite in Nigeria and it's something we really, really need to fix as we plan towards the next season of our elections. Well, yeah. Ikechi Wogu is an education uh, consultant and Bolaji Osime is a co-founder, trustee education and innovation team. Thank you so much for having this conversation with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, on that note, we'll take a short break to see what Nigerians have to say about government's efforts in ending school kidnappings. And when we come back, I'll be saying goodbye. I don't know, we get plenty problem for this Nigeria, but in that regard, I just feel like the first thing is to look at where the problem lies. So if the problem lies with like a particular, a particular bunch or a particular people, they need to be exterminated, they need to be removed. And then maybe from there, there can be some progress because these are our children. These are our children, these are my sisters, these are my brothers, and we're all one in this country. So it doesn't matter where it's north, south, we're all the same, we need to find a solution. Whoever's causing this problem, they need to be removed. The first thing for them to do is let them have, first of all, sympathy. That's, that's sympathy on the children, the parents of those children. If they put it before them, let's assume this is actually happening to their children. What would they do? What they would do if it's their own children, let them do it to these ones too. Because these are parents dying in pain. It's, it's, it's painful. The government uh, at least should know the right thing to do because those guys that are doing the attack over there in the north are terrorists, you know. Forget the name they attacked, like bandits, uh, unknown government and the rest. Those guys are terrorists. And we know the right punishment for terrorists. They are not to be pardoned. They are to be tried in the court and they are to be jailed. Let us uh, start from the security first. So we need more... The government should try their possible best to make sure, at least we need more securities. Uh, that one is most, most most important thing because they have been long. They never recruit police. Soldiers are also the same thing. So if we have more, more policemen and, uh, personnel. yes, personnel, at least they can be able to overcome the kidnapping. Well, that's uh, the show for tonight. Hopefully, we'll be back tomorrow at the same time, 7 p.m. on Plus TV Africa, as we discuss the politics of Nigeria and maybe Africa. I am Mary Anakon. See you tomorrow. <laughs>